Eh, muchas gracias a todos por, eh, por venir. Eh, un momento para notar que este es el primer panel en español que se hace en el GFN, lo cual para mí es un gran honor tal vez estar aquí. Y especialmente por la, el romper ciertas barreras que siempre se ha limitado lo que es el habla hispana, no solo en acceso a información, sino también en transmisión de información, que es muy importante para nosotros, especialmente en un año donde hay un, un, eh, un evento tan importante como es la COP10, la cual se va a celebrar en Panamá. Eh, vengo aquí a cuatro hermanos, muy honestamente, que son personas que conozco hace muchísimo tiempo y admiro muchísimo, que tienen entre muchas cosas y muchas habilidades y cualidades algo muy importante y es que todos en cierta forma han incentivado la participación de la incentivate the participation, they motivate people to participate throughout their countries to express their desires to move to participate in society. In, in topics surrounding how to how to claim the rights that they have as a stake as the most important stakeholder um with them being being the consumers with especially with the huge problem regarding tobacco throughout the world we know that we know that in countries with low and mid income Um, low and mid-income countries, 80% of of people consume tobacco, so they had to participate in the in the decision-making process. The, the COP10 will, will be carried out on, 25, on the 25th and 26th of November in Panama, and currently and historically, we know that access to this conference has been denied and we have been uh, we've been avoided uh, permission to to talk about these topics inco has been the only the only stakeholder that has participated but um the rest of the participants then voted to to kick them out we're not allowed to to express ourselves or our thoughts and we're not allowed to access um, a reduction um, damage reduction processes, which would be very important. The countries that have, that have agreed to, to, to this convention are participating in, in this COP10 and we, we should be allowed to claim uh, our rights to, to damage reduction processes. So firstly, I'll, I'll present Juanjito, my dear Juanjito, a professor and, and legal advisor. And I'll ask you, what are we defending? What, what rights do we have regarding damage reduction uh, in tobacco? Well, thank you. When we think that we have to defend something, we we sometimes simply mention ideas the, such as rights to personality rights to health rights to decision to make decisions in this case if you can show the presentation i'm trying to propose a key word which is access which what are we trying to defend when talking about um, human rights with this word access what do we have access to what do we have um rights to access first of all access to technology access to information access to make decisions access to products access to variety The freedom of developing your own personality is, is not enough. Once we have that freedom, there should be certain factors that at the same time allow us to, to make these decisions by ourselves. First of all, let's talk about access to technology. 
The first thing we need is for technology to exist. Does it have the 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 rights or the own that technology, make it available and and sell it? How many times are there technologies that are hidden or or they're kept away from from all of us? At the same time, it sh that technology should be publicized and it should be readily available. Likewise, and this is something we see in, in Latin American countries mainly and lower income countries throughout the world. Is that manufacturers create good products that are fit to the, to the standards set throughout the world as, as this will be something that people will be consuming. It should be executed properly. And at the same time, technological developments should be should be motivated and incentivated so that we keep on improving and companies keep on creating more technology. So technology must exist, first of all, and we should be able to access it. Secondly, we talk about the forums, not, the, not only in Spanish ones, but in English ones as well, is access to information. What a problem this has been throughout the world, right? It's a human right that we should be able to access information, especially from governments, especially based on, on scientific um, evidence. But how many times have we received um, information that is simply um, political propaganda? So we should be, first of all, be able to trust the government's information that it's that is the correct information. And this will be this will be the basis of, of what's to come in the future. And the second thing that's important is how can we how can we see that that a data obtained through science is is uh, is correct? Because if if we if we cannot assure that is how will a consumer be sure about what we're told? So people won't be able to, to make the correct decisions based on the information that they should have at their hands. We should be able to check um, this data, compare it. And, and we often talk about um, rubbish science that is, that is created to just promote other, other products. So we should be able to to compare the data and so it's actually real. Just like we sit down to debate, science, scientific um, evidence should be compared to see what is what the truth is, compare their methods. This way of comparing data should also enable campaigns to exist to compare these results and demotivate people from using certain substances. Likewise, we have access to decisions, to decision making. Apart from knowing how the product works, I should be completely free to make decision of consuming, of using a product or not. Once a product exists, customers should be free to, to decide whether they want to use a product or not. It's about freedom, it's about conscience, and it's about using the information that derives from science. We, with our with our with everyone's capacity, they should be able to to make this decision on using certain devices or or products or not. It's a it's a right we should have. And finally, using using um, damage re reducing um, devices to substitute the consumption of of combustible cigarettes should also be be readily available to, to consumers. 
And finally, we'll talk about access to products. How useful is it for me to be able to vape as, as you're allowed in Mexico? where you're allowed to consume it, but selling it is illegal. How logical is this? When developing our own, we should be able to have whatever product we want at our, at our disposition. We should be able to consume it. If I, if I have the right of using something, if I have the information, if I want to use it, but I can't buy it, other rights are useless. Regulation is important, yes, to keep um, products away from, from minors. But those people that are quitting smoking through these technologies should be able to access these these products while keeping them away from, from younger people. Finally, and this is something that activists always agree on, is that the success of these products adapts um, to whatever consumers like. So there should, so variety should exist. And this will enable people to easily change from uh, the usual cigarettes to, to whatever they want. Different tastes and different smells are, are important here. This will help people to to leave conventional cigarettes and use this type of technologies. This ends my presentation. We always think about human rights. We always say we have freedom of personality, access to health, access to make our own decisions, but this should be more precise about where, the, where these rights um, become become real. I've written a book called The Concept of Damage Reduction and Human Rights. This book explains what these rights are related to, this is more conceptual, but I will pass the microphone to Ignacio Leiva. We'll talk about the actual um, things that are happening, he's who's, who's trying to to make these rights actually exist, what has worked from his point of view in Chile, and how these actions have a, have certain make sense and, and have success with regards to, to human rights. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Quito. First of all, I'm extremely grateful to be participating in the first chat um, in GFN Spanish. It's an, it's an honor and I'm very thankful for this. Just as Joaquito said, users should be able to say a lot and we have to say everything that we want. Nothing will exist about us without us, but it isn't easy. The Chile experience, in which I've participated for 13 years as a pro-vaping activist. We we currently have e-cigarettes in America. We don't have any other products. Um, and this is, this is changes evolution throughout time because consumers don't have a right to speak. We're, we're vetoed. The first time I participated in the, in the, in Chile's Senate, I wasn't even allowed to talk. And throughout consumers, the, the pressure uh, throughout different campaigns, we eventually managed to be able to, to speak in the Senate. We had the right to speak, but we didn't have any, any actual success. But throughout time, consumers became more relevant. We became more important, having been better positioned which was something that seemed impossible at the beginning. The discussion at the beginning was very prohibition-like, and nowadays damage reduction is talked about, at least, which is hugely important. Due to this, I've been invited to talk a bit about what has happened in Chile, to see if it'll be, it'll be an example for 
for people to to be able to apply this the, the, these same issues in in their own country to have a positive influence and participate in, in legislative processes to do this we have seen so how do we have to activate consumers in other countries in 2019 we started a, we started a campaign which had this objective and it's important not to forget objectives our objective was to inform consumers fight against dis <clears throat> the lack of information and through this information motivate them and integrate them consumers must feel a part of the of the movement not just feel as a consumer they must know that there's a huge risk in in e-cigarettes disappearing so we started a web campaign first which was specifically in Chile, but then throughout connections and throughout social networks and other associations, it became bigger. And, and there's something important in this. Campaigns must group people, not just because of the campaign itself, but when I invite Argentina to participate in this campaign, my campaign grows. <clears throat> because Argentina has that, those same issues, for example. Same thing for Brazil. And that's how we opening our spaces and working together as a, as a team. All of the campaigns must know that it's their own campaign, but it's an open campaign. We're all in this together and we all have the same objective. One of the toughest things when starting a campaign like this one is losing our fear. Our fear to what? Our fear to failure. We f we're we afraid of that's our worst enemy when starting our campaigns. We were the first public campaign. Okay. Those, there'd only been one in the world, which was the one in Germany. And our biggest fear was losing losing our fear and but still it happened and it worked so the limit was whatever we set it to be and and we see how much it's progress now we've just tattooed someone here and this movement keeps growing and a campaign like like the one we did taking a vapor to to run the Santiago Marathon and him going through the finish while while vaping. It's it's huge. We have to think outside the box. And that's part of the invitation that, that we're going to make in this panel for people to think, to imagine how we can keep growing and how to keep participating for this topic to keep growing and growing. Another thing, and I'll and I'll keep it short because Jeff isn't looking at me with a very friendly look. Is that it's hugely important to understand that this is a very long fight. We have to be to persevere and be be very patient. We didn't see any results from 2010 until 2020. It's 10 years of work with no results. And then the last few years from 2020 to now, and these three years, we've seen and picked up all of our hard work. The images we've, we've seen, photos of the street. We have to do things to, to keep this movement growing. And that's where I'm gonna, that's where I'm gonna leave. Cause if not, I'm gonna go for too long. Thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot, Ignacio. And from Chile, we go to Spain. I think everyone recognizes Julio. He's a he's a big personality regarding information and content creation regarding damage reduction process, harm reduction processes. Sorry. So what's worked in Spain, what hasn't worked in Spain, what can you say about this? Good evening, everyone.
it's an honor it's an honor to be here in this first panel after so many years coming here it's truly an honor so let's move to spain spain's a country where if we win a football world cup everyone takes to the streets but if our, if our human rights are taken away or if we're attacked for anything it's very very hard for people to to participate and move and fight for something which in this case is vaping which has in some cases saved people's lives like ignacio said it's hard to motivate them and it's hard to keep them with us someone might be motivated for one or two days after a certain news comes up they wake up after that but sometimes it doesn't last longer than than one or two days in spain and it might be common in in many other countries there's been two pillars to to trial this so social media and secondly shops i'll talk about social media later but shops have a huge have huge importance at least in spain and i'm i'm sure it's very common in other countries there's a huge number of vapors that aren't on, on social media so you have access to to these products thanks to these shops and thanks to the advice they receive in the shops so it's very hard to reach them as they don't have social media so those are the two weapons we have basically on on social media we've tried a lot of things some have been successful some haven't been so successful so things such as tweet bombs and You, you can sometimes ask people to sign a petition through a through a raffle which might seem slightly unethical sometimes but at the end of the day it's complicated to reach to reach everyone it's hard to motivate them so we have to try everything so whatever we do has to be based on on our end goal these are the these are things that have worked the most in the end as as ignacio mentioned before with with the march in chile we also did one in spain it was one of the biggest in the world i think it's one of the initiatives that i'm most proud of because we moved buses from the whole of spain for this for this march we went to scream our truths to the to the ministry and we we managed this through through social media and through the through the information uh, given in given the little in the different shops and their the shop owners sometimes we're seen with a bit of hatred i think from when when businesses enter activism so we have to get rid of them i think we we can't forget that most of the people from that sector have arrived to to these products as consumers so we have to expand all of our information we have to communicate it to more people And I'll, I'll repeat what uh, Ignacio said. We have to keep working together. That's our main pillar. And we have to work a little bit more. And Francisco Ordonez will continue talking about, about the same topic, if I'm not wrong. So we'll, so we'll see what he says about Colombia. Something very interesting that's rarely mentioned is that remembering the analysis done in in 2021 89% of the market is from emerging um businesses so there's that and there's still that stigma of not involving of not involving uh, 
businesses due to due to what happened of tobacco companies in the past so when we see what happened in spain we'll then go to colombia where where there's been some very interesting initiatives so let's see what has worked and what hasn't worked in colombia i'll i'll also thank GFN for allowing me to participate here in this first Spanish day. For those that don't know who we are, we're the first um, consumer-based um, company in Colombia. Group, sorry, not company. Spain has been our mentor and what we have created here in Colombia has helped us, for, has helped consumers from other countries to want to create um, consumer organizations in, in their own countries. That's why many um, groups are called ASOVAPE throughout the, throughout the different countries. That support is, is, is very important for us and allows us to have this this present uh, in in Latin America, sorry, in Chile, Ecuador, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Uruguay, Argentina, and other countries where the name wasn't registered due to a legal problem, such as such as, uh, uh, Panama and Brazil had that issue, but they're still here. This allowed us, and along with Jeff, we started creating a, a shadow company, which would then end up being ART, which would group all the users from Latin America. Working together is one of the key components of this. And it, we're always collaborating with each other. This is teamwork. And we have to learn from from teamwork um, throughout this process. It isn't an individual battle. Many people are working, working together. Maybe this is our name, but work has always existed. We've always found support from each other whenever we need it, and we keep doing it, and we'll keep doing it in the future. Other organizations have have joined. Acción Técnico Social in Colombia has joined us three or four years ago. And they work with harm reduction. And they've now started working on harm reduction with, with tobacco too. So we have to look for the experience that other organizations have had and especially organizations that have worked with other substances as as they've been here for longer so they'll they'll know more about all this and this is what's happened with aso vape it's to avoid repeating the same mistake and avoid the uh, potential problems as I mentioned, Jeff, maybe three, four, five years ago, I don't remember. In in Bolivar, we had with Hulu visiting us uh, for a convention, and different different people joined us to to complain to the to the Congreso de la República. It it moved people. It moved users. It was a significant um, manifestation and it was very interesting it showed this is, this isn't an individual battle but there's a lot of people behind us obviously the scenario changed and my my colleagues will, will agree with this the community has changed regarding this 
not everyone's on social media as julio said not everyone participates some people have become slightly demotivated the pandemic had an influence on this too but we have to keep being persevering to keep persevering i mean we'll win we'll win some battles we'll lose some battles surely but the war keeps going so what's colombia done Asavape exists because of because of all this it, due to the first attempt at regulating um these products so users and some small shops ended up creating as of after contacting um the spanish company that we mentioned before it moved our contacts and allowed us to to halt um these attempts to stop five projects at banning at regulating to ban um, flavors and and other scenarios too in this moment there are five uh, vaping regulating products in colombia what have you managed for these five products to only be one so there's so in congress they're they're debating all these products in just one we we support a a project that we that has come from past from mauricio torro senator e moreno is, is now is now leading it and 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 we're supporting a differentiated regulation that's what we're fighting for and i know other countries have fought for this in the past too because they're different products and tobacco so it should be regulated differently in this moment we also have there's also a, a a project to 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 put huge taxes on on vaping products, and we're fighting this. Michael Bloomberg is financing this through Union, through Tobacco for Kids. So we're fighting this. We're starting to fight this. It's it's our moment to fight these organizations especially showing that they say that we damage people and they attack us saying that we're lobbyists for tobacco tobacco companies they're the lobby they're the lobby makers their organization they are organizations that don't allow us to talk we try to work with one of them Apparently, try to protect kids from accessing alcohol, accessing tobacco, accessing vaping. They, they very quickly said no. They never allowed us to meet them. Clearly, they're following orders and they're lobbying. It's evident. We have to show this. We have to expose them. As, as I mentioned before, it's like a snake. You have to take their heads off. It's the only way of killing it. We've been very diplomatic in the past. Now we have to pick up our shields and dress up to fight. Because we've tried to be as politically correct as possible. And unfortunately, it hasn't worked. So we have to change our strategy. Obviously, and Jeff mentioned it before, the cop will be coming to Panama. And Tomas is our, our representative in Panama. And I think it's important. And we, we talked about this in, our, in a meeting we had in, in Colombia with, with some friends. Is that we have to request that countries allow us to talk. Right? That we should have, at least in Colombia. 
it's a it's a it's a right of citizens and i'm sure the same thing happens in other countries we have to request this even even through existing conventions delegations should should invite us invite other actors in this case citizens let's not talk about consumers let's talk about citizens with rights to participate in the commission we'll probably set we told no but we have to try it i think that it's also important at least in colombia to say that two years ago we mentioned we participated in a conversation in a conversation of, with the Chancellor of, of Colombia who represented us in COP9 and we exposed our, our opinions regarding harm reduction, the opinions of users, commercial, commercialization, our, the importance of um, underage user, underage people not accessing our products. But now it's important that once our delegations are there, that they request that Switzerland explain how they reached fi that 5% five per five percent, uh, reduction in, in tobacco and how England has implemented regulations in, in their own country countries are allowed to to share their their experiences and share successful experiences uh, regarding tobaccoism people mention the intervention in by by tobacco companies has been has been dangerous well we're not we're not a company, we're, we're just representing users. We're an organization that helps users and citizens. That's how I'll close my speech and we should look at the COP already. The ball's in our court this year in Latin America. Hopefully you have the support from everyone. And this is one of the many actions that we'll have. There should be a pre-COP and a post-COP where, where we should make ourselves felt. Well, Francis mentioned the practicability of Article 1416 that mentions that countries have the right of seeing examples, examples done in other countries which would be very, very important. And as you mentioned, and the examples of Switzerland, France, New Zealand, England, where we can see that uh, tobacco consumption is, is, is being reduced very quickly. So we should be able to see and request that these countries explain the success in the reduction of tobacco consumption to see why it's worked, why it's been so efficient i just wanted to to make a comment regarding the cop 10 most people know but everyone should know that this cop is a very risky one it's not a normal cop 10 cop there are three points that are very risky from this cop the first one is that they pretend to to restrict flavors one that's not very known is and a very important one a very dirty move is that they will try to redefine the word um the word smoke if they manage this if they manage this change and they're always attacking the same points and this is what we expect from this cop and that's why we call everyone to try and be there to to be seen, to talk to their delegates. And we have to be aware of this. The, the risk is real. And if I'm allowed to, to add this, when we can 
seeing Article 5.3 of, of the Marco Convention, we have to see the reality of, of what this means. Nowhere does it say that we're not allowed to conversate, to have dialogue with the different actors, even with, with tobacco companies. Are the, an, the anti-consumers say that say this they're they're the only ones allowed to talk apparently but no we should all be able to to participate especially people that represent consumers and represent citizens and i'll repeat so everyone's aware of this this article does not ban participants even tobacco companies can participate this is important especially when we talk about uh, representation delegates are allowed to to talk to us and if we want to, to talk about harm reduction we should be able to to talk this also cannot be used to deny that deny this right this is very interesting and we should we should talk about a, a study that says that 53 organizations 33 consumer organizations are not financed at all so it shows that they they simply work through through love and passion yeah and i'd like to say something else and something that juan jose mentioned mentioned before obviously with the support of other other organizations and and our lawyers who have huge experiences that we want to write a letter aimed at the aimed at the United Nations uh, human rights um, sector regarding the COP. This is necessary. We're already writing it. It'll be technically revised and technically seen by our lawyers for it to be precise. But it's necessary. Participating in decision making is very important. It's a it's a fundamental human right. So this is hugely important, and we have to find other routes to enable us to to participate in in the decision making process. What we what we try to do with this panel. This is try and see what we can add, what we can, yeah, what we can add to to this project, to this movement. What what do you feel that with a number of people from from South American activists in general? I'll explain the the questions from the chat arrived through through his tablet that's why i halted it so tobacco kills 50 percent of people 50 percent of consumers will 1.3 billion trees so why why in the uk is 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 it taken as dangerous and not in not in latin america well that we talked about this yesterday does the life in countries does a person's life in countries such as the united kingdom is it more valuable than than the life of people in south america or latin america i'll move away slightly from the question itself and i'll i'll talk about it in another way we've talked about the uh, philanthropist and colonialist Bloomberg. He's got movements in the most developed countries of Europe and North America. And he considers that these products have to be have to be re reduced in, in these European countries. But he, he blinks as us as monkeys in South America don't don't deserve these rights and they have to ban these products here. I know what I'm saying is, is tough. 
but it's what these people believe and they believe that the latin americans and i'm one of them are are inferior it's terrible that we're barely with them. they look at us we have a lack of capacity to choose for ourselves and it's what we what we mentioned before we're, we're all overage so the the state shouldn't be able to decide what we can or cannot do or how we how to administer nicotine to us i i think we're just the same as as them almost but there's two different perspectives one that looks at them and one that looks at us a question here from from diego a representative from argentina I want to appeal to people that, that are there, that are up here, because your reference um, for this fight. Maybe it's quite an intimate product for all of you, but how do you overcome failure? How do you, how do you overcome adversities? Because it's a very uneven fight. So what do you, what do you look at in these tough moments to keep going and keep fighting? I, I base myself on the people that are a part of the movements, consumer movements, for example. All pro vape in Mexico, Mexico, all these different, all these different organizations. Asovap in Peru, Asovap in Argentina. We we base our fight on all of us. We we support each other. Harm reduction. as a place and it'll it'll help a lot of people throughout latin america and we keep our keep each other motivated to to keep this desire to fight going at the end of the day it's it's tough yeah but we keep fighting i completely agree with jeff sometimes there's something a bit more internal but or more personal but we're completely convinced and, and science shows this that we're on the right side this saves lives it's clear that that we fight to save millions of lives and in my personal case due to my experiences i fight for those people's families i multiply this it's not only the user tobacco product tobacco addicts are demonized the, there's there's nothing else what what when someone says oh this person has cancer other people say well he smokes we're, we're demonized we're, people that smoke are demonized they're satanized it happened to me in the Chilean Congress not long ago. Uh, uh, someone said that um, smokers shouldn't be allowed to vote. What what planet do they live on? So I look at, at the family as well. They're being damaged too. We fight to improve all of lives of people, to save millions of lives. And as well as what Jeff said, which is for, to look for support from people that are they're in this also in this movement too and and the idea of beating bloomberg's uh, information people are stigmatized and and they think it's it's an adequate um thing to do to to, to prohibit them. I think something that's not to, to Jorge about this in, in Peru last night. And it's the fact that many of us are involved in this, have been here for a very long time. It's not new. We didn't join this movement yesterday. And receiving new people, new blood, which, yeah, sometimes it's hard. 
but it's fundamental because sometimes those uh, those of us that have been here for so long we crash against the same wall and we have so many defeats despite knowing that we're on the right side of history it's it's tiring so many impacts it's tiring over and over again it's tough so receiving new people that generally participate not just with signature people are uh, they're activists they're hugely important we see them with open arms of if i'm allowed i like to talk about the idea of what's happened in mexico or what's happening in mexico because mexico is clearly somewhere where you can see that bloomer's financing impacts regulations Our partners in Argentina, Chile, can sometimes see certain products that are added to to food to make them more. That comes from Bloomberg, just like um, the banning of vaping products comes from Bloomberg. In Mexico, they try to ban. Um, motorbikes from that had 600 cc had less than 600 cc from from motorways surprise surprise this also comes from bloomberg this initiative even mentions that it comes from bloomberg this term this idea of him being a philanthropist is, is clear he the all of this doesn't happen in in European countries. They don't need his money. But in countries of mid and low income, it's comfortable to receive huge amounts of money to impose ideologies. If he doesn't like vaping, we have to ban vaping. If he doesn't like motorbikes, we have to ban motorbikes. If he doesn't like you junk make... food, we have to ban junk food. And in Mexico, with our beautiful, um, beautiful governors and presidents, we do this, and they say that they do this. That's the worst thing of all. If you look at public information, such as the public public minister of of health, or who, who apparently <laughs> makes studies which aren't even based on anything, you can see. They all come from Bloomberg. They try and ban motorbikes from certain places thanks to the Bloomberg Initiative. They even say this proudly. A president talks about sovereignty and criticizes America and, and etc. Has, has governing entities received money in exchange for imposing ideologies. And what we fought against throughout these years is fighting these ideologies, fighting for propaganda. And when we talk about propaganda, it's about the position of ideas. It's not about publicity. The government cannot impose ideas. What can what can consumers actually think about? Y la frase de nuestro querido presidente de prohibido prohibir y parece que es todo lo contrario, ¿no? Eh, le encanta prohibir. Eso banning es lo... is banned. But he loves banning. And that's what we fight against in Mexico. Well, thankfully, harm reduction always wins in the end. Roberto, do you have a question? Well, uh, you you talked about other things so far, but I'd like to, to mention quick, two things quickly. First of all, is the prescription of banning in, in mid and low income countries exists, but it doesn't exist in, 
in high income countries, the, the strategy from Bloomberg and the in those countries where you can't ban vaping is to degrade it and then mine it. And that's when talks about flavor comes, uh, flavors, yeah. But that's another issue. Mid and low income countries have, have weaker institutions who haven't correctly applied protocols. So they mentioned that, that vaping is a distraction, which would, which would take resources that are, that would be useful in, in tobacco reduction. And that, that's a big issue. So we look at Mexican government, Colombian governments, all of our governments saying that they'll ban vaping. And we have this cash to do this. So where will this cash go? Will it go to health? No, it will go to a pharaonic project from the government or another thing, which are fallacies. And another thing I'd like to say is, that especially in, in these countries where institutions are weak, and law isn't properly looked at. Where projects could actually could actually work. Um, well, it doesn't really happen. If you look at America, Canada, the projects work because institutions are tough. They're hard. Smoke-free zones, for example, have worked. The stigmatization of smokers, but it doesn't work if if people don't don't believe in it. If I light a cigarette, people look at me ugly. There, there's popular support for this for these movements, and it's only possible in a dictatorship such as North Korea or in countries where, where laws are enforced. And we're, well, we're not North Korea, nor are we Switzerland, Denmark, etc. So these kind of the politics don't work here. And we see it through the prevalence of tobacco. It doesn't even work in Spain. It doesn't even work in Italy, etc. So in, in these countries of weak institutions who, who won't be able to fight tobaccoism, it's probably, there's probably an easier solution for it to come from consumers, from the consumption of alternative products. So it doesn't need regulation. All of the arguments from a union are rubbish absolutely rubbish or fantasies from a, from a person in New York, a man in New York, and we see it. One day, Tomas and I went to a meeting in, in Mexico when tobacco regulators talked about banging their chests, saying they were saving humanity, saving kids, criticizing tobacco companies. And I, I went out while I was tired and I saw they were belling illegal cigarettes just 20 minutes away from, from this meeting. They're selling illegal cigarettes. This is just, it's, it's just for show. There's a prohibition in Spain, in Mexico, I mean. Yeah, the market still exists. It keeps moving. So to answer what I, what I said before, it has to be based. The solution is in consumption. If the product is robust, 
it would have been destroyed already. But no, it keeps going and people keep using it. People notice how their body reacts. And that's what keeps me going. If I'm not allowed to talk, just like it happened in a forum in a Senate where I was on the blacklist, I wasn't allowed to talk. That's it. As if I had a, a Lamborghini like tobacco companies have. Yeah, there's failures. Even in my own university, I'm denied the right to to write an, an article with scientific data. They're, they don't even res, receive me. It's people influenced by New York Times and all that show. That's a failure, but what keeps me moving is consumption. When I go to the shop where I buy my vapes, is a number of people I see I see there. They present me. They don't. They're not interested in in me or or my speech. They're interested in the product that it works, that it's nice, that it's pleasing. And that's what will beat Bloomberg. This this is growing, growing, and growing. And also the industry itself. It's a giant that will, that will pop up. And I, I don't just mean Occidental and Occidental companies, but also those from China. There's business here. Let's imagine a, a future where, where control of tobacco is a nightmare. 50 years ago, 50% of people smoked. This has been reduced hugely, especially in developed countries. Now let's imagine a future where 50% of the population consumes consumes nicotine, but with only 1% risk due to them doing it through vapings. People, there's nothing wrong with looking for profit. There's nothing wrong with people making money out of this, selling a product that satisfies the consumers with a very small risk. Because everything has risks. There's nothing wrong with this. That sleeping giant will will wake up soon and consumption will keep us, keep us going. Adriana? Thank you. Just a second. I wanted to make a comment that I forgot about before. When we talked about integrating new new organizations that weren't necessarily involved previously, it's imp it's important to highlight that social action has been extremely relevant in the fight in Latin America. And I'd like to publicly thank through you, through your organization, that you've given us a huge hand in learning. How, how things work through your experiences in the past, as as this has taken you a long time, you're very welcome, and I'm thankful for what you've what you've given to us in the last few years. Well, thank you, and relate to to these battles regarding harm reduction and public health, access to information, and among among other rights. I'd like to talk about Roberto's intervention before. Our institutions are weak, and this and the COP comes as a huge risk too in the future, as as you mentioned before. So I'm surprised how how different states ignore the lack of respect for for their own country's sovereignty in different treaties. 
So I'd like to give examples where treaties should be voted on and they should be ratified in their own countries. And this is something some that should be talked about when talking about the COP, how suddenly new markets pop up, different products pop up, and they and they become a part of this treaty without without the sovereign state making a decision. For example, marijuana. When marijuana moved from one list as being the riskiest thing in the world to it, to it moving to a controlled substance, states had to sit down and vote in, in an international space that that decision they talk about um climate change in, in the paris treaty or or contamination through plastic de plástico de un solo uso. And, and banning single use single use plastic or to give another example the Rotterdam Convention declares what substances and what chemical substances are banned but to do this countries sit down and vote and make decisions on treaties and in the sense I'm very worried that COP will advance with this and make decisions which will then be used as an argument to to ban products in, in our own countries because there will be an international treaty that tells us to either ban or in the cigarettes how do how do we anticipate <coughs> ourselves to, to all of this <coughs> This is what they want to do. They want to define smoke, for example, define flavors. Going back after an international treaty exists would be would be very hard, uh, as as seen through through cannabis. So that's my question: How do we how do we make this a bigger issue? <clears throat> How do how do we anticipate that countries will actually mo modify and vote on something that will that will affect vaping and and e-cigarettes? <clears throat> What's argued at a copper recommendations given to given to different countries and they'll affect in in a non compulsory way all of the countries that you mentioned <laughs> but yes this is very relevant what's actually very risky is that they they modify the macro the medical convention they haven't done this this year <clears throat> because to do it they have to send it very uh, a lot of months before i think it's six months before it should have been sent in may <clears throat> to all of the different countries and to all of the different re representatives for it to be studied. <clears throat> so you ask, what do we expect from this year? Well, we're calm to know that the medical convention won't be changed, <clears throat> but we'll actually be talking about a recommendation. What's the problem with this? <clears throat> is that if the medical convention is changed, it will, this will be imposed in all the countries. For example, if it banned different flavors, all the countries are, are obliged to, to, <clears throat> to follow this. So this is for countries that follow the, follow the convention itself. So Chile have to follow it. Argentina don't have to do it, for example. And they receive, they, they look at, they look at another way and, and avoid this. <clears throat> Hopefully this won't happen. Dentro de la Top Reg 8 ya sabemos cuáles son las cosas que se están tratando de implementar dentro de las recomendaciones para el tratado. Well, we know what's, what's trying to be imposed, such as flavoring, the use of external batteries to avoid consumers manipulating products, the changing of, of voltage 
which would which would allow people to change how much vapor they they inhale so the idea is for for consumers to not have an autonomy on on the product itself <clears throat> yes and i'll add something that we sometimes ignore but it's, it's ridiculous uh, from the anti-tobacco <clears throat> groups they always talk about tobacco companies that were associated to them but for example the issue about <clears throat> restricting the fact that products be be refilled or the voltages change or have an external battery etc guess guess which is which one is the only industry that <clears throat> that it helps our competitive um it, it's tobacco companies i'm not talking badly about tobacco companies <clears throat> but this is this is the truth it helps them i'm i'm getting mixed up it, it might happen but at the end of the day everyone that's the, criticize the tobacco companies well many of them positions that they want to impose on on vaping to 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 worsen the experience of vaping while well, they're only favoring tobacco companies issues such as devices being closed or or deciding how many flavors can exist the only sector that we favored is the tobacco companies which shows that our speech is just false they only want to bother the consumer without seeing who they will actually benefit they say they want to <clears throat> they want to reduce the consumption from from underage people well do they have any projects to to have the law go against and um, people that sell the sell products to to underage people no they don't we proposed that in chile they didn't they're only fighting for for their own pocket they're a mafia in chile <laughs> well the, i want to talk about what happens in mexico with this well well our government says they they banned they don't allow it well what's currently being talked about is is seeing if, if human rights are are being harmed and, and what's what's happening in mexico is that prohibitions come out and and tobacco companies suddenly uh, well these these regulations don't apply to them suddenly once they say that prohibition is exists well it's a lie philip morris as well as other distributors such as oxco they they can all sell vape uh, vaping products legally so who are they who are they affecting small small consumers small businessmen who have, who have devices where they have different flavors uh, variable voltages so clearly the the speech doesn't just reduce flavors but actually is only benefiting tobacco companies i'd like to add something to to this and to, i'd like to say it's important to discuss the right to pleasure roberto mentioned it before puritans people are being denied the rights i've been vaping for i think 11 years if i wanted to quit i would do it but i received pleasure from it why would why would they take that pleasure away from me it's like when someone wakes up 
and has a cup of coffee and enjoys it. Why will this pleasure be taken away from us? Society is imperfect, laws aren't perfect. We're human people and we all enjoy in different manners. So we have to fight for this right, the right to enjoy. I enjoy vaping. I enjoy nicotine. Nicotine helps me to focus, to concentrate. Why would they take that away from me? We all have that right. And something important that I didn't mention before, when I talk about England and, and Sweden, they say that Sweden isn't the first country. Isn't the first country. They mentioned Turkmenistan. The first one. Where rights are ignored, women don't have rights. They're extremely orthodox with their culture and all that. So do we end with consumers? Do we end tobacco companies? No, that's that's not the solution. And that's what the World Health Organization is saying. They say it's not Sweden, it's Turkmenistan. They prefer choosing a, a country where human rights are brutally massacred rather than say the truth. As time goes along, we have, we have more tools to show that this is a, an actual alternative. It's an alternative that helps you quit, but also allows people to enjoy the pleasure, to help them concentrate, to reduce anxiety. I know many people saw Aaron's documentary on, on nicotine, talking about Parkinson's. Nicotine has medical capacities that should be explored more. There's scientific evidence around this. I know we've all done it. We're not we're not all doctors, but we're informed consumers. And we make informed decisions. And we want consumers to make informed decisions. I think this, this is a very important thing, and we all have to keep going. It's important to, to see issues such as um, bipolar people it helps them significantly. So what moment does access to a product which has um, which has positive effects on, on different people in society? How How is this right ignored? Well, it shouldn't be. And when we talked about access before, this is this is where it becomes important information should should end up with with practical practical applications it shouldn't just be banned because i don't want people to smoke francisco mentioned pleasure not just pleasure but decision making the right to make decisions i remember when i used to smoke at the end i didn't even like it but i just did it because i wanted to because I'm allowed to do, I have the right to do whatever I want to do. It's a freedom of development of personality. I'm allowed to do what I want. We've seen absurd prohibitions. In America, there's prohibitions on sexual relationships. They make so many prohibitions. They go into people's beds. How do we allow this? How do you allow them to, to get involved in my decision making? If I want to vape, I should be able to vape, or I'm allowed to smoke, or I'm allowed to do whatever I want. We should focus on this. When the cop wants to make decisions that affects consumers, we have to request that this is not done in this in this way. They bring act activists out, they bring it out to the press. 
and they go against us, the vapors. We have to do what someone else decides, who probably doesn't vape. It's incredible. All of this information, just as, as Jeffrey talked about before, has to be brought to the table and it has to be part of the decision making process. I can talk about Mexico, I'll, I'll repeat, because we have certain, certain figures that are useful for this, such as a right to petition, which I think allows in every country. And yeah, we should request this. It'll be denied. We won't be allowed to participate in the COP, but we should, we should apply to it at least. I'm a lawyer, as you can see, and I like fighting people. But we have to look at ways to not allow them to impose things on us. We'll talk about pleasure. It shouldn't be only important for us vapors. It should be important for everyone. And we'll talk about Bloomberg. First of all, it was sugar. Now it's vaping. Tomorrow will be alcohol. What about the day after tomorrow? Chocolate? Cookies? Coffee? Sex? How far will we allow them to go and and restrict us, restrict our freedom? We're conscious adults that should be allowed to make decisions. I think we're reaching the end. So I'll, I'll only say the fight keeps going. Yeah, I think we're done. Who's, who's getting stuck? Okay, Eileen, you go first. Or Facundo. Oh, okay, Bastian, you have the microphone. Oh, thank you. I've written it down. One person shouting makes more noise than 100 people are quiet, so I'd like to thank the activists who are at the front of the battle. This has allowed us to advance uh, with regulations throughout different countries, just like Chile. Going back to the, to the main topic is how do we motivate the user, creating a community, keeping them informed, and create a sense of belonging, that they belong to this fight, that something that will receive something back. Humans in general and people in general it might have someone with our Latin culture. And maybe doctors from Argentina, Spain, and other countries could say that people react. They don't go to to doctors proactively. You go when you're two days away from, from dying. Work. We go to the mechanic for our car when it's almost finished. So the biggest efforts regarding regarding vaping, which which have got huge results, is focusing on the benefits of of vaping. Do you believe that there's there's more success in communities? When, when they think that the benefits will be cut? Okay. Do you think it's more important when, when that threat seems to be taken away tomorrow? I'm asking this because if, if, they, if they think that this will happen very soon and this right will be taken away from me, Maybe maybe our efforts could be focused on on campaigns and and clickbait regarding that that tomorrow you'll lose your right or that in cop cop ten 
<ríe> en, la, en la COP10 eh, te van a cortar el derecho a poder acceder a los sabores. Right of accessing different flavors. Do you not think that would be more, more effective taking campaigns like from this perspective to create more, more participation from from citizens because they're more more reactive? Well, yes, the, the, this does happen. But to the second thing you mentioned, I'd, I'd actually say no, and this is the reason. If we constantly repeat the same action, it loses effect. We've seen it in Spain a lot of times. We've we've had a sword on our backs a lot of times, but we've we've managed to stop it. But if we keep saying this, consumers will just know that nothing actually happens. So effects effectiveness will be lost. Eileen, your your question. Yes, I'd like to, to ask you something. All of you, what do you think about vaping? If if you think that they'll they'll talk about lithium, they'll talk about uh, damaging the environment. Do you think they'll they'll go at us from that point of view? Yes, they're already doing it. I'll talk about Colombia in particular. There's a popular action, a mechanism, where they're attacking attacking certain companies. Va directamente al Ministerio de Medio Ambiente por no controlar. Obviamente tiene que haber una responsabilidad. And they're going against the environment through lack of control. So yes, the industry has to be responsible. In Colombia, we're working along with some companies and some stores, some shops, and and different organizations. To create a recycling and reusing process. Some products could be reused, such as lithium, and others that can be recycled. I think associations have this have this work, especially in educating, and negotiating too, and and managing the different stores and different companies, because we think it's important. I think it's one of the tasks that we have to have to do it's already being done in Colombia but we can't let time go by very quickly or we'll give them another another reason to criticize okay let's let's close with this one I'll be brief because we've run over the time going back in time slightly about Mexico, Argentina, Chile. We talked about how to integrate um, sellers. I think in Argentina, we, we're not afraid of integrating them into activism and into our fight. But in countries where it's banned and they're repressed either legally and, and that, even though users have the right of being socially disobedient. Well, we're always supported by, by shops as, as users. They're small sellers and they support the user. Not, they're not allowed to help us directly. What advice could we give them for the future and for future regulations? What should, what should they prepare themselves for? Or what should they imagine from the future? In countries where currently it's banned. Maybe we didn't explain ourselves properly. As to what we want from the industry. It should be a, a method of communicating with the consumer. Once shops are, are committed to 
to remove it, we reach users much easier. It's not, reading a post on social media isn't the same as actually preparing the sellers in, in stores to inform users um, once they reach the store to talk, to talk about participation with, with consumers. Because if you don't participate, I won't be able to sell at some point. Or if we manage for this to advance, we, we, might ma we might manage to, to sell this to you at half the price. At the end of the day, it won't happen that quickly. But they have to be a part of the connection to reach consumers directly and for them, for the consumers to become a part of, of our organizations. For example, I always say there's a thin line between users and sellers. Why? Because many users from small stores were at some point smokers or vapors. They, they've stopped smoking, but they also saw a business opportunity and the chance of helping other people. So there's a thin line. I think consumer organizations should communicate frequently with, with, com with small shops. In Colombia, we've always informed small shops and we, we work very hard with this. And we work with not selling to underage uh, consumers. There's a chat with most stores and they they communicate with each other saying that by, by products, saying that he's got an illegal, it's a fake document. I think that's one of the things that could be done. There should be constant dialogue because they, they repeat the, the communication we get. There should be constant dialogue with them. And, and yes, that's important. Okay, just to to close, I'd like to th thank everyone that's here, to thank GFN, and wish wish them a happy 10th anniversary and how nice it is to, to hear some Spanish at GFN. Thank you very much.